Well, thank you very much, Melanie, and thanks for the sponsorship of, uh, of this uh, workout session or breakout session from Desjardins, so that's fantastic. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to walk through a little bit around employee engagement. Over the next uh, 50, 50 minutes or so, what I hope to do is introduce you to a little bit around employee engagement, uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges around it, and actually try to leave you with a couple of tools that you can hopefully use back in your workplace. That's what I always find that uh, conferences and events that hopefully walk away with some tools can really be helpful in terms of moving forward. And I guess to start off the session today, a big part of what we do is really look at what's coming around uh, the future and how do we help organizations change. And if you sort of looked at all the different ages we've gone through, and I thought Josh Burson earlier today uh, in the keynote talked very nicely about where the future of HR is going. But we've gone through so many ages, you know, the Bronze Age, the Industrial Age, uh, the Computer Age, and, and now moving into the Digital Age. And you sort of think, well, where's the place for humans in that? And how's that going to change with all this AI and uh, machine learning and all these types of things that are coming out? And I guess what we see in the workplace, even though all this stuff is happening, more and more people are becoming that much more critical to today's workplace. And that's what I want to touch on in a little bit. I have two quick slides on who Telemap is. I think it's important to understand where we're coming from uh, from a perspective so you know who I am and where my content is coming from. And that helps you put that into context. We're a company that helps clients uh, measure uh, manage and improve employee engagement through asking questions. We have pulse surveys and full engagement surveys, safety surveys, 360s, and a range of different tools. And we work with a range of different companies uh, across Canada and uh, into the US and over in uh, Europe and, and uh, Africa and Asia and those areas. So just a quick snapshot about who we are. So we've been in business for over 17 years and have had a chance to survey both uh, small and large companies, private and public sector, and we've also been the back end for uh, Canada's top 100 employers for many years, collected survey data, which gave us a great overview of what's going on on engagement across the country. So that's a little bit about who we are, so you understand where I'm coming from in terms of the data that I'm going to review today. So one of the things that, you know, and I, I know I'm teaching or preaching a little bit to the, to the converted when I talk to a human resource group, but people are really a critical component of any workplace today. And part of the reason why is because they have a lot of upside. In fact, unlimited upside in terms of our capability. Often, many of us feel untapped in that we could provide a lot more to our employer or to the work or task at hand. And we're really being held back by some of the uh, roadblocks, some of the technology, some of the policies within today's workplace. So there's a lot of upside in people. And I think that's part of the reason why uh, the engagement is such a critical component. The other thing is we're very versatile. As individuals, uh, to be able to switch from one industry to another, from one sector to another, as an asset, you know, if you looked at human capital as an asset, we're incredibly versatile, a lot more versatile than a factory or a particular physical uh, facility, which once you set it up to deliver one type of widget or an automobile factory or something like that, it's very difficult to switch over to another sector, or another industry. Humans and people can do that, and they're so the very versatile. So these are some of the reasons why people, I think, are very much still underrated uh, in the workplace by senior executives and, and the C-suite. And I want to touch on that a little bit. And I think employee engagement is really the secret sauce that helps drive much of what can happen in the workplace in terms of better productivity and better process. Uh, the, it, it's interesting, uh, in terms of the percentage of dollars or number of dollars that is spent each year on employee engagement, the estimate comes around a billion dollars a year, 750, 800 million dollars a year in North America. That's how much we spend on employee surveys, recognition programs, and related type of activities to improve engagement in the workplace. And the estimate is that that's only about half the market saturated. So only about half the organizations are actually spending time and energy on trying to investigate and understand engagement. And there's a long way to go. So there's probably the market size of just measuring and understanding engagement is probably close to $1.5 billion. So it's a very big market. But when you look at the last 10 years, or even the last 15 years, and you sort of think, well, what have we gotten for all that money 
that we spent in the workplace to measuring engagement and engagement initiatives and recognition initiatives and pizza lunches and you know all of those types of things we're trying to do to drive engagement. And it seems like we've gotten very little. And in fact, when you hear the data, engagement seems to be fairly flat and it hasn't really increased over the last number of years. So you wonder, well, what's going on? We're spending all this money, but we're really not getting a lot of benefit. We're not seeing improvements in engagement and you'd expect that to be the case. Part of the reason why we're not seeing improvements in engagement is because it is very poorly understood in the workplace. And in fact, if you went out there and asked 100 organizations if they had a definition of engagement, only 25% will actually have a defined definition of engagement. They actually know what they mean when they talk about employee engagement, meaning 75% of the organizations don't even have a clue or don't even have a good indication of what they're really measuring and trying to improve in the workplace. So I think that's part of the reason. If you sort of think, well, we're trying to measure something and we're trying to improve it, but we really don't know what we're measuring. So it's gonna be very, very difficult to improve upon something you really don't know what you're measuring. So a very small percentage really actually have a definition. And of those who have a definition of engagement, only about 14% actually have it well understood throughout the leadership team and the, and the management team. So engagement as a concept is still really poorly understood and I think uh, Josh Burson earlier today in the, in the keynote talked about how complex engagement is. It covers a whole range of things from technology to leadership to diversity and inclusion. It is really a complex concept that we're really still struggling to understand. And in fact, if you sort of looked at 14% of 25%, that's really about three to 4% of the organizations out there have a clear definition of engagement and it's well understood by their leadership team. So there's really a lot of lack of knowledge and lack of understanding around, around the definition of engagement. Let me, let me just sort of touch on a couple of things. And, and I know a lot of you are familiar with this, but I always like to sort of start with what is engagement and what is it not? One of the things it is not, it is not job satisfaction. There's a very big difference between employee engagement and job satisfaction. You can have a very satisfied workplace but not a very engaged workplace. That's very doable. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I come from Ottawa, and uh, we have a large uh, government uh, contingent in our workplace. And I can assure you a number of uh, departments and ministries within the, within the federal government in Ottawa have a very satisfied workplace. If you ask them about their pay, their benefits, their vacation time, their sick time, all of that aspects, well, I'm very happy, very satisfied with it. But when you measure engagement in some of these departments, the level of engagement is incredibly low. Not all departments, but in some departments. So that's a very good example where your job satisfaction does not equal employee engagement. I think that's really important to understand. Engagement is a much more robust measure of how people feel and think in the workplace. And I'll touch on that in just a little bit. Probably the best two things I think about the difference between satisfaction and engagement Often when you talk about a satisfied employee, they're thinking about what do I get? What's in it for me as an employee? What's in it for me in terms of the employment deal? When you're measuring engagement, yes, you're interested in what's in it for the employee, but you're also measuring what that employee will willingly give back to the organization in terms of discretionary effort. So it's a measure of what they're willing to give, not just what they're willing to get from the organization. I think employee uh, engagement, having a definition, this is Talent Map's definition. I'm gonna just break it down for you a little bit. I don't, I, if you don't have a definition, probably a good one, please steal it and use it. Uh, if, you, if you have a definition, then that's great too. Work through your definition of engagement. But it's important to understand what engagement is and what isn't. And when you're measuring through surveys, you're measuring how people psychologically relate to the organization, you better have a good construct or a good model of how that is measured in the workplace. Let me break this definition down a little bit before I get into the head, heart, and hands model. Basically, employee engagement is a positive, energized state of mind. So energy, right, that's an important component. State of mind is also a very compo com uh, important component. State of mind from a psychological component implies that 
the, that mindset will be fairly stable over a period of time. So if you survey in January of 2016, and you go back and you survey again in January in 2017, or, or maybe six months later, that state of mind, how, how employees uh, view engagement has been fairly stable over that period of time. That's an important understanding around a definition. And the reason why I say that is because there's a completely different side of engagement that people look at, and a lot of people think it's momentary, meaning your engagement can fluctuate quite a bit throughout the day. So you could have high engagement at the beginning of the day, low engagement at the end of the day, or vice versa. So that's a momentary, moment-to-moment uh, -moment engagement, which is different from a state of mind. So understanding the definition is very critical to how you go about measuring it. The other important thing I want to touch on the definition of engagement is it is a cognitive and an emotional measurement. So how people, uh, how you measure engagement, it's really how people connect logically to the organization, and we we express that at Telemap through uh, head, heart, and hands. And the logical con connection is really, can I achieve my career goals here? Can I achieve my financial goals here? Uh, those types of, is a commute reasonable? Is the space OK? All of those logical things that are more tangible, people think about. So engagement should entail a measure of how people logically connect or rationally connect to the organization. A good measure of engagement should also have how people emotionally connect to the, to the organization. Do my values, and what I think is important as an individual, do they align with the values of my peers, the people I work with, my boss, my uh, purple, uh, person I report directly to, and the overall leadership team? And the better we do at aligning both the logical component and the emotional component, the more likely are we going to get that behavioral output that we associate with employee engagement. Probably the best two words to think about, if you walk out of here and say, well, what is employee engagement? The most common two words is a measure of discretionary effort. And I often say sort of engagement is sort of a low level of engagement or zero engagement is doing just enough not to get fired, right? You say, you get by, you don't get, you know, you sort of keep your head low, uh, you don't get sort of uh, called out. So that's zero level of, of engagement, where if you're high level of engagement, you're firing on all cylinders. So that's really where you're measuring engagement. It's at a very different level uh, from satisfaction. I'm not going to go through all the data around uh, what links engagement to business results. I know a lot of you have seen the business case for it, so I'm not going to go through that. What I want to point out is almost invariably, whatever way you look at engagement, uh, there seems to be a very strong evidence that links employee engagement to better business results. And it could be around goal attainment, job, uh, community satisfaction if you're nonprofit, safety, productivity, retention, public confidence if you're a, 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 a government or, or um, 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 public institution, those types of things. So no matter which way, it is a very good situation for the employer. They get a lot out of highly engaged employees. But what's also interesting is there's more recent research about what, what's in it for the employee. What do they get out of being engaged, other than a, a happy employer? And really what they get out of, the, the research recently is showing that there's a very strong link between employee engagement and individual health and wellness. And these are just, I'm going to pull out a couple of studies here. Uh, one study was University College London. And what it did is it looked at uh, the level of engagement uh, and relationship between uh, an individual and their direct uh, boss. And they actually broke the groups into three groups. And one group was uh, employees that received positive, uh, constructive feedback on the work that they did. A second group was they received feedback, but it was negative feedback, uh, critical feedback, they weren't doing a good job, but they were getting feedback. The third group were employees that didn't receive any feedback whatsoever. And in fact, they were almost ignored by their boss. What was interesting in this study is that they learned that um, the level of stress in those employees that received no feedback at all, didn't, almost ignored by their boss, was incredibly high. And they measured stress through the level of cortisol in the bloodstream, which is a measure of, uh, of common measure of stress and an indicator of stress in, the work, in, uh, in your physical um, bloodstream. 
And what they found is there's very little difference between those who receive negative feedback and those who receive positive feedback. So uh, having no relationship or poor relationship with your boss seemed to really impact your level of, uh, of relationship and level of engagement. This article was sort of sensational. It went a little bit further because cortisol could lead to heart disease. It sort of said, your boss can kill you. And it sort of went on about, uh, about the impact of not having a good relationship with your boss. So I thought that was sort of interesting. One other study I want to touch on is child's sense of well-being, uh, being affected by parents who enjoy their work. It was an interesting study done out of Boston College, and it looked at highly engaged parents, or highly engaged employees who were parents, and disengaged employees who were parents, and then they tracked the behavior of their children in the school over the next few to three to four weeks. And what they found is highly engaged employee, uh, employees who were parents, their children just basically were regular, you know, they didn't act out any unusual levels or amount, where Parents that were disengaged, employees that were disengaged over parents, their children tended to act out significantly more in school. They were called out to the principal office or an incident was written up and so on. And the idea that the research looked at is how contagious engagement could be, both on a positive and a negative way. It actually noticed that, or the theory is, that you actually bring engagement home with you or you bring disengagement home with you and you affect others around you. In this case, you were affecting your children, and they were acting out in school because they could feel uh, what was the emotional level of, uh, of their parents. So very interesting look at engagement because it's not only good for the employer, as a lot of us know, it is actually really good for the employee. And that's part of the reason why it's taken on such a, such a life, because it's good on both sides of the equation. Well, in... Um, in today's world, we hear a lot of, you know, robots are going to take over the world, they're going to replace us, or AI is going to, is going to uh, uh, take all, away all of our jobs and we're going to be uh, uh, searching for something to do. And I think in part that's true. Uh, the, the routine jobs, the boring jobs, the stuff that really should be automated, uh, robots will take over or AI or machine learning uh, will take over. But what it's going to do, it's going to leave a very unique place for employees and for people in the workplace. And the reason why is because there's something that people can do that computers can never do. And that's really generating empathy. So one thing that people can do is they could look at another human being or they can another group of human beings and they could very quickly express or understand how that person feels or thinks or is motivated in some respects. A computer cannot do that. And that's part of the thing that as, we're, as the world becomes more complex and as relationships become much more important, having that relationship or that ability to relate to others is something that will become more and more important and computers will never be able to replace that. A, a real good case in point is the number or the growth of jobs in certain fields. If you looked in uh, healthcare or social services, Anything that relates to interacting with people, providing empathy, the percentage of growth in those industries are double and triple the percentage of growth in a lot of other industries. 20, 30, 40 percent in human-related services in our economy over the last 5, 10, 15 years. So we're seeing a lot more growth in that, and computers will not easily replace that, but they should easily replace other jobs. So we will still have a place, and engagement will still become even that much more important as our job changes from routinely dealing with a task to interacting with people in very complex situations. You know, all of this stuff around engagement, we spent lots of money and time on it, and uh, what I wanted to show you here, uh, uh, Telemap's been in tracking engagement for over 17, 17 years, and what's interesting, it's pretty flat. You know? In terms of the index we see across Canada, uh, the engagement index has sort of bounced around 66 to 70 percent over the, the way we measure it over the last uh, over the last 15, 16 years. So it hasn't certainly been major changes despite all the things that we're doing. And I want to look at some of the things that we are doing well from an engagement perspective. So, so what are we doing well from a, an employment perspective and from different organizations perspective that seems to be uh, uh, resonating with some employees in some cases? So one of the things that I think we're doing, and we're very early on on the importance of engagement, is we're building a lot of awareness. Uh, there's a really good tool 
it's on Google called Google Trends. If you ever wanted to go and see what people are searching for, you go to Google Trends, type in a word, and it'll tell you how often that word's being looked for, uh, what parts of the world that word comes up a lot or looked at. When you type in employee engagement, and they started Google Trends back in 2004, so you can see it continually has been growing in terms of the number of times being searched out there. So it continues to be important. What's interesting though, if you break this data down and you start to look at where in the world are they looking for engagement? So yes, Canada, United States, Europe, but interesting, Asia and India happens to be the uh, country that looks up employee engagement the most. They're trying to understand engagement better, trying to understand how to improve engagement. So in different parts of the world, it continues to be a, a universal phenomenon. And what's interesting in India is the fact that there's a lot of people. So you think, well, can they not just find someone else? Part of the challenge is in India, the, uh, the level of talent needed to do some of the work is not there. A lot of people, but not a lot of skilled people. So the number of people that they need, and so when they find someone, they do really want to engage them. So that continues to, to happen. A Couple of things organizations are doing to drive a better experience and better engagement out there. Uh, one of the things, you know, and Josh talked about this a little bit, this is sort of the linear career paths that we see or had saw in a lot of organizations. Uh, Deloitte's been doing a very good job as a company to changing that mindset. So when you join Deloitte at one time, you would start off as a junior consultant or junior auditor, then you become an auditor, then a senior manager, then a director, then a partner, if you moved all the way up the chain. And if you took time off to maybe travel for a year or have some children or do something different, you got out of that track very, very quickly. What Deloitte has done is they said, well, that doesn't make sense given the changes in the world. And what they've done is they created an environment within their company that was much more accepting to people who might move up for a while, but then might move laterally. Or they might move up for a while and then move down for a period of their life. So starting to try to map flexibility over a career, and they call it the career lattice. Very, very interesting perspective. The other thing different organizations are doing, this one's really interesting, it's over in, uh, in uh, Europe, over in Finland. And what this organization is doing is they realize that sitting down, and, and uh, I think we talked about that at the keynote today, sitting down actually affects engagement, in fact, causes disengagement. So they're actually designing a workplace where there is no seats. There's no place to sit down. You can lean, you can kneel, you can stand up, but there's no seats anywhere in the, in the organization. And that's the design on purpose of this organization. And what they did is a preliminary study is they found that people working in this environment were showing higher levels of happiness and higher, higher, higher levels of engagement and well-being. So different organizations are experimenting with different things out there to try to understand how to grasp engagement. This one's interesting, it's called the jolt. And the, and the jolt is it's something that goes on your wrist and uh, it's a, you know, if you look it up, it's in the US, it's a company that's created this little, uh, it's like a Fitbit type of thing that goes around your wrist, but will give you an electric shock if it thinks you're disengaged. <laughs> so I, I'm, not promoting, uh, I'm not promoting the jolt, but, uh, but it's interesting how different organizations are approaching it. Uh, the, th this one is actually designed for employees uh, inside of uh, restaurants and hospitality environments where they have to go in and clean a washroom or something like that and they have to do it in a very specific, did you change the toilet paper, did you wash the toilet, did you clean the sink, did you wash the floor? And you have to do all of those things, check it off and if you don't check it off or if you're not active for like an hour or two, it'll actually give you a jolt and you could adjust the, the level of joltness and also uh, how frequent it would jolt you over time. Again, not promoting this as a method to drive engagement, but just to give you a sense of where organizations are going to drive engagement. Another thing, uh, and Josh talked about this, uh, about this key card that uh, you have to volunteer, it's not, you're not forced to do it, but this is out of MIT, and it's a small card that go, you can hang around your neck. What's interesting in it, it's got a microphone, it's got an infrared sensor, so you know if there's another person nearby with that same card. It has an accelerometer, like what you have in your, uh, in your iPhone or you know, smartphone or Samsung or, or Blackberry or whatever. And it also has a Bluetooth. So what it does is it tracks your activity throughout the day. And it'll actually measure the intensity of your voice through the, uh, 
through the microphone. It doesn't necessarily track what you said, but the level of intensity. If you're leaning forward throughout the day or in a meeting, it recognizes that as being more engaged than if you're leaning back. You know, and it's starting to measure different approaches to engagement. And I sort of wanted to point this out because how really we don't understand engagement near as well as we think we do, and that is why I think we're not improving it. We just don't understand what engagement is, and we're trying all kinds of method to really, really track it in a much better way. This is just what, what conceptually will happen. You're wearing your card and you can interact with other people. It knows who you've talked through throughout the day, what building you've been in, and, and so on, and they can aggregate all that data and look for ways to drive better productivity and better engagement. You might recognize this guy. He, uh, he actually has a booth here today. Uh, he was also in Alberta, but what's interesting, uh, you know, kick, kick the seed out of your work habits. You can actually order this. This is from the government of Canada. You can order this and, and uh, go see, and you can put, create a cardboard stand-up desk. And, uh, and the idea is standing up again, similar to the European example, will actually give you more energy and more engagement than sitting down. So different organizations trying different things. And then finally, I thought this was interesting. This is over in the UK. Uh, what the UK government, it's partnered with academics as well as um, uh, private sector. And it said, you know, engagement is not just good for individual companies, it's actually good for the whole country. So what they're promoting is a much more engaged workplace over in Britain with the underlying belief that high levels of engagement will drive greater gross domestic product, greater GDP and productivity for the country, and greater wealth and prosperity for the whole, for the whole nation. So it's a very, very interesting perspective that different people are taking on engagement. I'm, going to, uh, I'm just gonna do a quick experiment. If you pull out your smartphone, what I would like you to do is um, I'm gonna have you text to the number 37607. Just, this is just sort of uh, 37607. So that's the number you're texting to and just Type in in the text a talent map. Once you do that, it'll get a reply and said you've been accepted. So you can actually complete the poll. And then uh, just, just the question is, who's primarily responsible, from your perspective, what do you think? Who's primarily responsible for employee engagement? Would you say it's primarily the executive, frontline managers, or the employees? So you should be able to type in uh, 37607 and then just type in uh, a, B, or C, and you'll start to see, there we go, we start to see some responses coming up there in terms of the data. Okay, so I'll just give it uh, just 30 seconds as you guys, we collect a little bit of data, and this will give a bit of perspective of what the audience thinks about this in terms of, uh, in terms of the perspective. Oh, okay, there we go. What do you, am I standing, do I stand here? Excellent. <laughs> Good. Okay, it's sort of settling in there uh, a little bit. So, uh, interesting. Uh, so, okay, a little few more here. We'll just get, let everyone finish up, or at least get a chance. So I think it'll probably balance it around that. So about 60, 63, 62%, 63%. Frontline managers, so you know, frontline managers are really responsible for engagement. About one out of five, 22%, putting the onus on the executives, and about 15% on the employees. So interesting perspective on, on how you see. And I think that's what I want to look at over the next, uh, over the next 20 minutes. So where does that onus uh, reside, or where should it reside in the workplace? So I, I want to touch on things that I think we're not doing so well on engagement. So we talked about what organizations are looking at and trying to improve and the different aspects, but what are we not doing so well? And I think part of what we're not doing really well is the onus or the focus of engagement. If you add it, the manager and executive together, you almost get 80% is responsible of managers. Very little responsibility on the employee. But if you sort of think about engagement, engagement is supposed to be a two-way street. You know, it's, it's my willingness to learn and get something from the organization but also willingness to give back to the organization. So I would argue that there should be a lot more onus on the employee to also be responsible for his or her engagement. 
when you look at uh, the internet, you go into Google and you say, type in employee engagement tips or employee engagement ideas, what you'll find is the majority, in fact, almost all the ideas and tips are what executives can do or what managers can do. Very little ideas or suggestions on what the employee can do to drive engagement. And that's what I want to touch on a little bit over the next, over the next 15, 20 minutes, is I believe we're only working on half the equation. We're really working from a HR professional and from a management professional as to what managers have to do, what kind of culture you have to create, you know, how, how many uh, ping pong tables do you have to have in your office and, uh, and social events and uh, recognition awards, how much of stuff can you put in place and how many programs, but very little about what could, it, the, what could the employee do and how does the employee start to take onus for some of that. So I'm gonna touch on that, but before I do that, I wanna look at what do we know about human motivation? And I think this book is a very good book to read if you're interested in this topic and if you haven't read it. It's Daniel Pink, it's called Drive. Uh, it uh, talks about the science of human motivation and drive in the workplace over the last uh, 50 years. And he boils it down to a really easy to understand method. If you don't have time to read the book, you can go to uh, YouTube and there's about a five or 10 minute uh, video that sort of gives an explanation of, of the book and you can just sort of type in uh, RS animation of Pink's book or, or actually, you know, these, these slides are available uh, on the website after this meeting. You can just grab that URL and type it in. You'll actually see a great 10 minute overview of what's in the book. But what's interesting, I'm just gonna pull out three nuggets or four nuggets that came out of the book around human motivation. When Pink sort of summarized all of the research and the science around that, what he found was there were three things that really drive motivation. One was autonomy. So people's ability to uh, make some of their own decisions, have some control over the workflow, uh, you know, that was sort of a key component of driving engagement in the workplace. The second one was mastery being good at something, or being fairly good at something and getting better at something. If you felt really overwhelmed by something, it, drives, it lowers your engagement, but actually feeling like you're pretty good at something actually drives up engagement. So having a level of mastery, feeling like you're making progress towards your goals or making progress towards your work tasks. And the third one was purpose. And that was a little bit about, you know, why am I here? What are we doing? What's the greater good that we're trying to solve other than just making money for the shareholders? So those three key things came out of this research and looked at all of the science that, that drives motivation. I want to point out one un interesting one is money. People often say, and if you talk to managers, you know, what's, why do people leave your organization? Oh, it's because you know, they got paid 10% somewhere else. And money can be a factor. However, what's interesting about the science around money and how it motivates, it's really a factor if the job is simple. So if it's a really routine job, like piece world, piece uh, work, where the, you know, the faster you work, the more money you can make, or a factory-driven type of work, uh, often, if you get paid more, you'll work faster. But what it also found that if it's complex, if the job is complex, and that's what we're seeing today, today's jobs are becoming much more complex through relationships and who you're interacting with, uh, the complexity of the world that we're dealing with, uh, the complexity of regulation and laws and how we deal with as a manager, it is continuing to grow. It's not getting simpler, it's getting more complex. That money doesn't motivate at all. Yeah, you have to be paid fairly, uh, absolutely, but paying more than market or more, much higher than what that job doesn't drive people's motivation. So very interesting read. I wanna touch on purpose because I think that's an important part of really what drives a lot of motivation today. Some of you might be familiar with this uh, book. It's called What Color Is Your Parachute? It's a fantastic book. It's been around for, uh, for about 30 years, and it's really looking at, you know, what is it, you read through it from your perspective, what is it do I, am I good at, what do I prefer, and it's a bunch of assessments and tests you do to determine what type of job or career you might like to uh, pursue. So that was all interesting, but what I really wanted to point out, when this book first came out in, in 1970, a study was done, and the same study has kept up every year. And the study asked about the level of meaningful work. And back in 1970, 23% of the respondents said they expect meaning from their work. So the balance, the other, you know, 70, 77%, 70, 
actually expected to bring home money. Right? <laughs> they wanted to earn money. That was why they were going to work. It wasn't for some greater good or some uh, larger purpose. What's interesting, though, that number has continued to rise, and now it's in around 67 to 70 percent. So people are expecting a lot more out of work than they did 20 and 30 years ago. And part of the thinking on that is because our social systems. It used to be you would get a lot of social support from maybe your church or religious group or your community or your family. But over the last 10 or 20 years, a lot of those have changed. Religious uh, has not been as important. Community has, has uh, sort of opened up a lot more in a much more global environment. So people are now expecting a lot more out of work than we ever have in the past. And I think that will continue when you sort of think that religious is not going to take place and give us meaning. I don't anticipate uh, in a general sense going forward. Communities and family are probably not going to get stronger. Maybe they might even get more dislocated over the number of years. So work will continue to be the biggest meaning driver for an individual uh, going forward. So that becomes a very important component. The Deloitte study that uh, uh, was talked about at the keynote, if you saw that, what's interesting, they talked about in this study millennials, and they thought the best leaders possess. So if you're trying to track millennials, they really put a lot of emphasis on meaning in the workplace. Uh, you know, they, if you look at what's out there in the, in the bookstores, a whole bunch of books on you know, why and the reason for work and uh, start with meaning and all of those types of things. Uh, so you know, not only do we see meaning as more important, younger generations are putting even more emphasis on it uh, going forward. This one I sort of thought was interesting because you sort of look at the, some of the things we just talked about. This is a study uh, done by American uh, Society for Training and Development. Well, well respected organization, very large organization that looks at training and development in the workplace. And it was a poll of about 800 readers of, of the magazine and what it did, it asked who's responsible uh, for engagement at work. And the green is senior leadership. So this is a respondent saying, well, I think you know, for meaningful work, uh, senior leaders are partially responsible. My manager is partially responsible. But I, myself, have the greatest responsibility for creating meaning at work. Followed by autonomy, I and then my manager, task variety, me and my manager, work low balance, me. Uh, and my manager somewhat, and of course feedback, you know, my manager has more influence on feedback than I do, and that makes sense in, in terms of that. So it's interesting in that employees want and perceive to take a lot more onus and ownership on employee engagement. They want to take ownership of employee engagement. We've got to figure out a way to do that, to give them some of that ownership. So I think part of the enigma, enigma with employee engagement is, uh, we have the right intentions, you know, generally. We're trying to do stand-up offices, and we're trying to do, you know, jolt. Well, maybe that's not the right intention. But we're trying to do all kinds of different things to drive employee engagement. So we're trying to do the right thing, but a lot of it, I think, is the wrong focus. And we lack some very simple but effective tools that can help drive engagement. And that's what I want to touch on over the next 15 minutes, or some of those tools that could be very helpful. So these are tools that you could use uh, for driving employee engagement in the workplace. Uh, and three of them, I can put it up here, and there's a number of them that we cover off, but three of them I wanted to cover on today. Uh, number one were stay interviews. Number two were effective weekly one-on-ones, and I'll touch on those in a little bit. And the third one are job crafting. So these are three really effective, simple, low-cost tools that you could take home with. And I'm just going to touch on uh, three of them. First, I'm going to start with uh, stay interviews. I want to touch on you know, what are they, why are they important, and just how to start them. So I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. I might spend just a few minutes for you guys to talk to each other a little bit around stay interviews, just to sort of uh, uh, change the, uh, the pace a little bit. And then I'll get into uh, inter exit interviews and uh, job crafting. So what are stay interviews? And, and maybe just a show of hands, how many people in the audience uh, do stay interviews now within their organization? So there's some of them. There's a handful, a few, few people putting up their hands. So let me just tell, tell you a little bit for those who are not familiar with stay interviews, what are they? So generally, a stay interview is a periodic, one-on-one, uh, -on -one structured discussion between a manager and an employee. Uh, and I, I mean that in terms of truly your manager and the employee, not human resources and the employee. So it, it's a different perspective. I think it's very important that it's between the manager and the employee. 
and that it reinforces, that identifies and reinforces the factors that drive employees to stay at the organization and to engage at the organization. And there's a lot of benefits of stay, stay interviews. So some of the benefits I've listed up there, uh, it, one of the best benefits is it stimulates employees' thinking. When you ask employees, what is it that causes you to come here? What's it cause you to stay at this organization? Or what could cause you to further engage in this? The, or, the employee often maybe has not thought or articulated very clearly, what is it that, that I really like about the work or about the team that I work with or about the organization as a whole? So asking those questions stimulates your thinking and helps drive just that fact into higher levels of engagement. The other thing is they build trust between the manager and the employee. If they're done between the manager and the employee, they're a fantastic way. And we often look at the research out there around engagement and disengagement. And often you hear lack of trust in the workplace or lack of trust of management. So this is a fantastic and simple tool to start to build some of that trust. Uh, they include action, so they're not sort of a general happy discussion. They really are sort of when you come out of it, there's some actions out of it. And they gen generate a lot less pressure both on the employee and the manager. They're not designed to be done around uh, performance appraisal time or performance review time. They are a very separate animal, and generally they're not even documented in human resource records. So I don't encourage them to be documented. It's a discussion between the manager and the employee, not a formal discussion that gets onto their record. The focus, it's always focused on the positive, so it's generally focused, what is it that engages you or retains you? They don't require a lot of training, and they're really, really cost effective to do. Just to give you an example of what a structure of a, an effective stay interview looks like, First of all, there's introductory questions. You know, first of all, if you, know, if, you're, if you know your employee really well, you might do this fairly quickly. If you don't know your employee well, you know, how's the day? How are things going with you know, your son, your daughter, your dog, uh, your hobby, or whatever it is that, uh, that you know about that employee? And then the second part is you start to identify the factors that make the employee want to stay and engage. So you might want to start with positive stay factors, or maybe what are some of the reasons you give to your spouse or your significant other that what you like about this job. Or when you tell your friends about, your, about the company, what do you say about it? And that's interesting. They start to talk about the things that they really like. And as a manager, you want to start to register some of those things. You might ask questions around, what's the best work of your life? What are the factors that create an environment that you feel you're doing your best work? These are the types of questions that elicit fantastic responses around what is it that engages an employee. Uh, things like, uh, you know, a fully used factor. You might ask, you know, when do you feel like you've fully used all of your skills in, in your job or your work? Those types of things where people start to think about really what is it that drives engagement. The second part of a stay interview is to identify positive factors to retention that might further increase engagement. So you might sort of, okay, what could further in enhance your engagement? You know, you might ask questions around, you know, are you better managed or could I manage you differently? You know, would you like to hear from me more frequently, less frequently? Or what type of interaction would you like? Starting to ask how you'd like to be managed. More positive elements or less fewer desirable asking about that or maybe asking about what's your dream job? What would be an ideal situation for you if you looked at one to two years in this organization? And then finally, the last part of an, an effective stay interview is to identify possible triggers that may cause that employee to consider leaving. So you might start to ask questions around, you know, so-and-so just left the organization you know, last month. What did you think about that? Did it get you thinking about looking for a new job? And invariably, people know who left, and people start to think about, you know, should I be updating my LinkedIn profile? Should I be connecting with others? For a manager to go out and have that discussion, even though a lot of managers say, oh, I don't want to talk about that. It'll bring up ideas. Those ideas are already there. And, and I guess that's creating that trust. And you're starting to acknowledge that these are individuals. And, and uh, by asking those, what are those triggers? Another really good way to identify triggers is ask about recent frustrations. So if you can think in the last two weeks, what are some times that you've been very frustrated with work? Someone often, they might say, well, I, I couldn't get the information I needed when I was traveling. Uh, the, the network was really slow, or I couldn't ac access these files, or I don't have permission to this. These are the types of frustrations that really bother employees, and because they want to, generally, they want to do a good job. Need for time. What, what I like to do, I, I'm going to just sort of change the pace a little bit. I'm going to give you just about four or five minutes 
what I want you to do is just turn to the people, person on your left, and I just want to give you an example how simple and easy it is to do just the front part of a stay interview. And all I want you to do is, if you don't know them, introduce yourself. So, hi, I'm so-and-so. If you know each other, then get right into it. And all I want you to do is just identify the factors, identify the factors that make you want to uh, stay at your current job. What is it that is positive and you like? Sort of one minute on one side, one minute on the other side, and then we'll come back together and finish off. So just one more minute. I'll just give you one more minute. Okay, maybe we can, uh, we can just sort of wrap up there. Maybe we just sort of wrap up there. Okay, thank you. Maybe you could just sort of get your attention back here for a few more minutes. Thank you very much. If I could just grab your attention for the last 10 minutes or so. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for participating. And I guess what I wanted to sort of indicate, I know we didn't go through a whole structured stay interview, 
but how easy it is to get into that type of dialogue uh, with people maybe you know or maybe you don't know that well. And, and sort of it's a very effective tool, so I highly encourage you to take it home and share with, within and use it within your HR department and get your, start to get some of your managers to use uh, tool very, very effective for engagement. Uh, I'm not going to do exercises on these other ones, uh, but I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, effective one-on-ones. This one's really interesting because when we ask uh, managers, how often do you do one-on-ones? Almost, oh, we do them all the time. I have them in my calendar. They're booked all the time. And you know, okay, great, great. When we ask those same employees, you know, how often, when's the last time you've had a one-on-one? -on -one? It's like, oh, what? I haven't had one in three months or six months or, you know, my manager always schedules them, but he cancels them or she cancels them at the last minute. You know, so it's a very interesting perspective. They are really not done well in organizations. And that's what it is. It's not a difficult thing to do, but it's a difficult thing to continually implement and execute for managers and employees all the time. I want you to touch on what we see in organizations as the most effective one-on-ones. So first of all, uh, when do we do them and, and who does them? First of all, they're for most managers and they should be done weekly with each team member. So everyone that reports to them should be an effective one-on-one. -on -one. I'll talk about how long they'll be and stuff like that. The odd manager, some managers it could be bi-weekly, so every two weeks. So sometimes you have, a, in healthcare for example, you might have a really wide span of control. And if you say, well, I did one-on-ones, I'd spend my first four days doing one-on-ones, I have to start all over the following week. So, you know, sometimes every two weeks is okay. So for the odd manager every two weeks and only a few manager monthly. So the default is once a week and they should be 30 minutes maximum. And I'll talk about the time in just a little bit. With whom do you do, you know, basically everyone. So you don't just say, well, I can only do one-on-ones with, you know, my new people. And these people, I've been managing them for 10 years. I know them very well. I don't have to do them. I think it's very effective to do it. You should be doing it with all of your direct reports, not select direct reports. Uh, where do you conduct them? I think it's also important just to think about that as a manager. You know, they don't have to be in private, but ideally not in public. Uh, you know, if you have an office, great. If you don't have an office, uh, a discreetly done in a cubicle works well. If you're out in the field, a pickup truck, can be very effective, a coffee shop can be very effective, so lots of different places they're doing, so you don't need a, a private office to do these on a regular basis. And the most effective one-on-ones that we've seen and it's the best practice is they're typically 30 minutes or less. So sometimes they're less than 30 minutes, but they're never more than 30 minutes. Usually they're scheduled with a clear agenda, 10 minutes for the employee, so you get the first 10 minutes to employ what's on your mind, what are the issues, what do you want to talk about, and that gives the opportunity for the employee to maybe pack up issues that came up through the week, and if they know they have a regularly scheduled one-on-one, -on -one, they're not going to pick up the phone or send an email randomly throughout the week around things that are not urgent. They might be important, but they're not urgent to bother the employee. They'll wait for their one-on-one because -on -one they rely on that one-on-one -on -one to bring up issues. So it reduces the amount of interruptions that the manager receives, and it gives that confidence to the employee that these issues will be addressed at some point, and I have a, I have a venue to do that. Ten minutes for you as a manager. So that's really important too. The second 10 minutes is what is it that I've heard from corporate? What are some changes? What do I want to communicate uh, to this employee? What are things that I have to uh, get across? And what's interesting, if you looked at the research as to what's the most effective way people collect information in the workplace today, number one way is direct communication between my and my immediate manager. Email, intranet, senior leadership town halls, all of those are much lower. The most important communication method of how I understand what's going on is that relationship and that discussion between, and this provides that venue, and it's only 10 minutes for you as a manager. And then the last 10 minutes, how do we delegate? How do we move this employee forward? How do we give them professional growth opportunities uh, in terms of what the manager should be focused on? You know, and typically, I know it's only 30 minutes, but typically it does take about 10 or 15 minutes for a manager to prepare for each effective one-on-one. -on -one. You know, they should be making a few notes, you know, uh, you know follow-up notes, what, what are commitments I made in the last one-on-one. -on -one. If an employee asks me to follow up on, you know, why does my phone not ring properly when I get calls from outside the office or something, you know, the manager should follow up on those particular things. So if they made commitments, they should do that. You know, and then, you know, to make sure you did that, because that's one of the things you often hear in surveys is, oh, no one, I, I bring things up and nothing ever happens. Uh, you know, and this is an avenue for that manager to actually help make things happen. You also want to be thinking, what positive feedback can I give? Going into the one-on-ones, what is it that the employee does well or I've seen them do well that past week that I can give them feedback 
What corrective feedback and is there something that I could delegate? So those are some of the things. I have a lot more detailed list. Uh, happy to provide you around the scripting and all that sort of stuff around effective one-on-ones. But it's probably the most underused tool in today's workplace and it drives engagement. We notice that organizations that use this, their level of engagement is incredibly high. This is a very simple one-on-one -on -one form that managers typically use, you know, team member, date, department, and then some personal notes. One of the questions we asked on our survey, my manager seems to care about me as a person. Strongly agree to strongly disagree, and it correlates to engagement. And if you, as a manager, don't even know your staff or don't have a clear, you know, are they married or are they not married? Do they have a spouse or not? Do they have children or no children? Do they have pets or hobbies? Having a little place where you mark this down and be able to review it, you can actually have that bit of a discussion around, hey, uh, over the weekend, how was, you know, how was your you know, uh, kiteboarding or photography or whatever event that you particularly uh, uh, participate in? Team members update what, what they brought in to the meeting and then your update. So very simple, very straightforward in terms of, uh, in terms of that. The last, uh, so that's, that's one-on-ones. The last tool I want to introduce uh, is job crafting. And job crafting is a very interesting tool uh, in that I'm going to tell you a little bit of what is it, why it's important, and just sort of how to start it, just to go to think about it a little bit. Job crafting is sort of something we do now, but we don't really think about it. We, don't, we haven't really uh, uh, couched it in these terms. But basically, job crafting is thinking about your job from three levels. Thinking about the actual tasks that you do in your job. You know, what, what am I doing in terms of delivering output and actually activities that I do? The second thing about job crafting is thinking about relationships. Who do I interact with? Who do I interact with more? Who gives me energy? Who doesn't give me energy in terms of my day-to-day -day interactions? And then the third component of job crafting is cognitive crafting. How do I think about my job? How do I, what's my perspective about my work? Task crafting, you know, the part of task crafting is starting to think about your job and taking away tasks or adding tasks, but not doing it in a way that you're changing your end deliverables. So if I'm an accountant and I want to be in marketing, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get rid of all my accounting tasks so I can go over and do my... You're still doing the core deliverables, but you're doing them in a different way, and you're starting to, to think about how do I do it. And I'll show you an exercise uh, that works, and this is some research out of University of Michigan. So what they've done is they've looked at employees that are very engaged and what is it that makes them different? And these are one of the factors. They were incredibly good at crafting their job. So these researchers then went, well, how do they go about crafting their job? And these are the three ways that go about doing it. They break it into tasks, relationships, and cognitive. They didn't use those terms. These are sort of more academic terms that they used. But it's interesting in that these are employees that were very highly engaged, and they engaged them, uh, engage themselves. Uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, of task crafting. It might be a, a computer uh, programmer that, uh, you know, that goes out and sits all day and does program, program, but is sort of maybe a little more on an extroverted side or a social side, so wants to interact with others. So maybe they participate in the social committee or something external, maybe a customer advisory board or something external to the organization. So that's one way they do it. Cognitive crafting, I'll give you a really good example, a personal example. Uh, I, I had a chance to, uh, in my 20s, go over to Japan, and I, I taught English over there for about uh, three years. But after my first year and a half over there, I was teaching, you know, whatever, grade threes, grade fours, house, housewives, business travelers, and stuff like that. Really enjoyed the first year. Fantastic culture, fantastic food. Second year was good because the yen was strong. I was making some money, could save a little bit. Going into my third year, I was like, oh, I don't know if I could face another, you know, three-year-old coming in, uh, working through sort of basic grammar and stuff like that. I went to a workshop. And the uh, leader of the workshop, was, I worked for the YMCA, and he talked about, uh, this is for English teachers at this workshop, talked about uh, why we're here as English teachers. Yes, we're here to teach English and help them learn and so on, and that's what I thought I was here for. But he also talked about how we're creating bridges between cultures. How, uh, this is in the, in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, how uh, them learning more about Canadians and more about Western uh, culture, and you're learning more about Eastern. To me, that was, wow, that was, it really sunk in. I ended up staying there for two additional years because when I went back to work, yes, I did the exact same job, but I thought about the job very differently, and it gave me more meaning into the work. So an example of, uh, of job crafting. This is an example of a job crafting exercise we do with, with companies. And basically, we have a workbook that works through. But you can go online and get this workbook. Uh, University of Michigan offers it. But basically, um, employees go in. They write in their tasks. They write in their relationships, their values, their strengths, their passions, 
and then they group them into ways they do in the job now, and then there's another slide where they actually group them into ways they'd like to reconfigure their job. So it actually makes them systematically think through tasks, think through relationships, and think through the cognitive components of their work to be able to reconfigure their job, still delivering it, but in a way that they would be more engaged in the particular job or the particular work. So, Finally, I'm just going to close up. I know I'm sort of running uh, uh, a few minutes late. Uh, I guess, and we saw this uh, version of this slide earlier today in the keynote. I think what's happening is, you know, organizations are not changing very quickly. Uh, you know, over time, they're, they're not adapting, but technology is causing us to adapt as people a lot differently. And uh, the pace of change is speeding up, and it's causing a lot of disengagement in the workplace and challenges in the workplace. And we're trying to figure that out through lots of different tools and lots of different processes. And I guess what I'd like to leave you with is just sort of challenge yourself as HR professionals. Absolutely, I don't want to dismiss how important leaders are and managers are in the workplace. Uh, you know, they have to continue to lead, they have to continue to create a culture of engagement. But I want to also encourage you to focus on the other half of the equation. What is it or what can you do to start to create ownership for engagement among your employees. And these are some simple tools to start that process. Uh, stay interviews we talked about as a way for them to spark the thinking. One-on-ones uh, is a very good tool to be able to have that relationship and trust and, and encourage that engagement. And then job crafting, a particular tool, a particular method to actually get people to think about their job differently, which then can further enhance uh, their engagement. So I guess I'm going to leave you here. I always find this is one of my most favorite quote. I would always like you to go back, and if you could at least employ one of these, two of these tools, you don't have to do it throughout your whole organization, but if you can do it within your HR, human resource department as a starting point, and if you like some of them, then maybe you can roll them out into a, a larger group within your organization and hopefully start to get more effective around creating a better employee engaged and employee experience out there. Thank you. Thank you.